Good evening and Merry Christmas Eve. It's so great to see all of y'all here. We're here. It's Christmas Eve. I bet a lot of you woke up this morning thinking there's no way this is Christmas Eve, but it's wonderful to have you here in worship. My name is Sandy Hurd, and I'm the pastor here at First United Methodist Church Heath, and it's really wonderful for you to be here. We are going to have um, Sunday morning Christmas services at 1030 tomorrow morning with the opportunity for you to wear your favorite pajamas or your matching pajamas, whatever you've got. But that's what we'll have tomorrow, and I invite you to come to our worship tomorrow morning on Christmas Day. Uh, For those of you worshiping online at at home, we are glad that you're here as well. We will have a sacrament of Holy Communion, so I encourage you to take a moment to gather your communion elements. And then also we will end our service with the traditional singing of Silent Night with candles. So all of you in here, make sure you have a candle. Margaret can get you one. And for you at home, make sure you grab a candle so that you can have that ready and welcome the spirit of Christ in your holy space. Uh, I want to take a moment to encourage you to register your attendance here. This is just for an opportunity for us to know who's here and who joined us, especially on a holiday day like this where you have so many people from out of town. And the, there are several ways that you can do this. If you prefer, you can uh, do the traditional way, which is the paper in the back of your pew there with, that is blue and white. Fill that out and just put that in the offering plate um, when that time comes, and we'll pick that up. Or you can open up your phone, pull out your camera app, hover over the QR code in your pew back. That will bring up a link. When you click on that hyperlink, it'll allow you to put in your name, your email address if you would like to share that, and also a prayer request if you have any of those joys and concerns you'd like to share with us. And then last but not least, we do have our mobile app, and that's probably the best way to be updated on everything going on in the life of the church. And so if you just go to the App Store or Google Play, you can find our mobile app there under First United Methodist Church Heath or First UMC Heath. There are a variety of ways you can find that. And when you do, you'll see um, our church calendar, You'll see links to our um, services in the past. You'll also see an opportunity to give there. The Bible app, devotionals are on there, but also an opportunity for you to register your attendance. I just want to encourage you to take a look at that app if you haven't already downloaded that app. And so um, it's a really great opportunity for us to know who you are and that you're here. And so as others are coming in, I just ask for you to center your hearts and your minds, open up your heart for the spirit of our Christmas worship as we invite the King family to come up and light the Advent candles and do the Advent reading. Advent hope moves us. Advent love leads us. Advent joy stirs us. Advent peace stills us, that we might affirm our King, Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah proclaimed a time when those who walked in the shadows would see a great light. A light would shine and a child would be born to us. The evangelist Luke painted the nativity sky and repeated the heavenly song of the angels. Glory, peace on earth, and goodwill. John declared that this great light is Christ, the light of the world. We light tonight's center candle in celebration of this great light that lives among us. By it we behold God's glory, full of grace and truth. Truth, excuse me. We have witnessed to this very hour, this very night, and we hope that the world has heard the good news. At Christ's nativity we now rejoice. God has been born among us. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled. Our love is consummated, our joy is complete, and our peace is sealed. Let us pray. O holy God, our life and light, thank you for coming to us this night. Thank you for touching all heaven and earth with your splendor. In every corner of the world, shine this night with your peace. In every corner of our hearts, shine this night with your grace. Amen.
John Lee Christmas. encourage our children to come forward as we share the gospel with children. If we have any children here in our seven o'clock service, come on down and forward if you'd feel up to it. If not, that's okay too. So since we're all children of heart, right? All children of God, I'll share our little children's lesson with you. Unfortunately, I just don't have enough candy canes for everyone to share, so... That's the only thing. The kids got that. So for you kids, I do see. I'll get those to you later. Oh, yeah. Tom's coming down. Now he, now he is motivated. Yeah. Come on down. Oh, here. Y'all want to come down? Our children's time. Oh, yeah. Would you like candy cane? So this is, I think, watermelon or strawberry, and this is pineapple, and then this is regular. Do you want to have one that you'd like? Yeah. I think this one, and I think this is this one's green apple. I think strawberry. Do you want one? Which one do you want? Best peppermint. So I have all sorts of different candy canes here, and you see candy canes a lot at Christmas, so you can have that one, yeah. So basically, here's what we're going to talk about with these candy canes here for just a minute. So sometimes, do you ever see these candy canes on trees? On Christmas trees, sometimes people do that. And do you ever wonder why it's shaped like that? Mommy needs a candy cane. Oh, I think you're so right. She does. Oh, and then you can give them to your family members, too. I like that you're looking out for them. I bet they, I bet, I, yeah, I bet she will open it for you. Have you ever wondered why it's shaped like that? What do you think it could be? Think about Christmas. Who are some of the people you can think about? Oh, do you see, look, look do you see up there? And that blue, that purplish blue sheet thing? You see that shape? Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's like a shepherd's, shepherd's staff, and, it, and they can reach out as shepherds can go out with their sheep when they're taking their sheep, and they can kind of reach, extend their arm for, forward and bring their sheep closer to them. That's what they use that hook for. So oftentimes that's what we look at when we see the candy cane and we think of the symbolism of the shepherd's staff. But if you also turn upside down, what, what letter is that? It's a J. Yeah. And whose name starts with J? Jesus, exactly. So the candy cane also reminds us of Jesus when we see it. So one, it's a shepherd's staff. At Christmas time, we think of the shepherds when they were told of the good news of Jesus Christ being born. And we think of when we turn it upside down, we see a J and we think of Jesus. And I brought several different colors because I think it's really nice when we think about the different colors and different ways people are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say a prayer with y'all. Do you ever pray? You want to put your hands together? And I'll just say a prayer for y'all. Okay, God, I give you thanks for these children. I give you thanks for their imaginations and their energy and the ways that they are so drawn to you this Christmas night. I know they have so much excitement for what is in store for them tonight and tomorrow. I know of the Nerf war that they have in store that they're excited about as well. And God, so we pray that when they have all that joy and fun that they think of you and they think of what a gift it is to be around so many family members who love them so much. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for being brave and coming on down. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to pass those out to your relatives? Think that they would like them? (laughs) Yeah. You want to? Yeah. You want to give it to your Mimi and Papa? There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Why not? Rewarded for coming on down, and and then plus when one breaks, you've got extras. I would like for us to just bow our heads and. Take a breath in and marvel in this night as we say our community prayer and our Christmas prayer. Holy God, you have appeared in the flesh, bringing redemption to all people. Your glory is made known in this newborn child, this living, blessed hope. Tonight we sing a new song. We sing a song of justice and righteousness and endless peace. 
And so, God, in that vein, we pray for all of those people um, in this congregation, our family members, our friends, who need to feel that peace and an endless peace, a righteousness. They need to feel your love and know that you're that source of love. So we think of them in their names as they come to our mind, trusting that you're making your presence known to them in this very moment in the ways that they also interact with your children. Heal them where they need to be healed. Reach out to them and bring them into your fold. Like your son, Jesus Christ, and like the shepherds who were tending their flock at night, reach out to them and care. Gift of God, beautiful Christ, child, we welcome you. Let love be born anew in our hearts on this joyous night. In Jesus Christ's name, incarnate, made flesh. Amen. We come to our offering time, and as our uh, ushers come forward uh, to take our collection, I know our bell choir is coming forward as well. We have this beautiful music tonight, and we're so incredibly grateful for the ways that everyone's worked so hard together to make this such a wonderful service. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your greatest gift, your very word come to earth to live with us and through us and for us. You have filled all of us with your grace and truth. Your holy child has been sent to free us from our bonds. So how can we repay such a divine generosity? Receive our thanks and praise. Receive what we have to offer you this evening. And as you have given to us, so now we share your gifts and your grace with a world that is in need a weary world. May they rejoice in your wonderful love that is so endless and profound. And may this offering help bring light and love to those who still wander in the darkness. Amen.
You may be seated. Since many have under undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. He belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. This is, the word of the, this is the word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sometimes we forget about how important that other uh, birth story is to the infancy narrative. And so it's nice when we get to hear how John came to be because he's really the precursor of Jesus Christ. And um, we've been talking a lot about how much more there is to the birth story of Jesus. So I want you to also hear these words from Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and it was taken while Cornarius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Digea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people to you 
is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of love and light, of hope and joy, God of eternal peace, make a home here within our hearts, within our spirits, that your birth may not just be an experience this evening, but one that really transforms us, moving us each and every day. In the name of your beloved Son, whose birth we celebrate this evening, we pray. Amen. When I was a kid, one of our Christmas traditions was to go to my grandmother's house. We would meet up with our aunts and our uncles and our cousins, who we rarely spent very much time with other than around Christmas, usually. And my cousin Mary and Robert would be there, and um, really I hadn't seen much of them since the last Christmas, and we would meet up with them, and we would do our kind of awkward greeting, and we're close in age, and so we would say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, so I'm in fifth grade, you're in sixth, okay, yeah. Oh yeah, a lot more homework, Mm mm-hmm. Yep, a lot more homework. Yeah, you know, I don't really like math either. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's nice. And that's, that was the extent of our conversation. We didn't have really much more to say because we really didn't spend very much time with each other. We didn't really get together more than that. And so we would, we would do that until our grandmother would come out with our presents for all four of the cousins, and they would be identically wrapped in the same way, in the same package, and we would sit on the hearth, and she would give them to us. And, of course, we would tear into them as fast as possible, feverishly, because usually we knew the first person who unwrapped that first one kind of indicated to the other three what the presents were going to be. Yeah, because we knew that we all got the exact same present, and it might be something we were going to wear or something that we would play with or a toy. Um, And although these gifts weren't really selected to suit our unique personalities, that's okay, there was something kind of cool about opening up this present and seeing this gift that we all four got. It was something that changed in the atmosphere as well. They were, they were ours. They were gifts that nobody else in that family received. It was just our thing. We knew that beyond our friends, they wouldn't have those. This, was be, this would be ours. And because we didn't see each other very often, that was the point in the evening when the mood would change. We would have, suddenly we'd have something in common. We had a gift in common. And our moods would change and we would have this renewed connection and we would talk about the gift or we would play a game together or whatever it was. And I would look at Mary seated with her identical present and I would realize she's one of us. This gift makes her one of us. Now, for some of you, you might have a similar story, and you're recalling your childhood, and you're thinking, yeah, if only mine were a gift. Mine were ugly matching pajamas. How many? Yeah? I've seen pictures of them. They're only cute at Christmas time. And I've seen the pictures, too, where it looked like at one point in time, those pajamas used to be curtains in the living room, or maybe even shower curtains with rubber duckies or something like that. And it creates this bond and this connection. I've seen those photos. Jesus is God's gift of ugly pajamas for the world. You're like, I don't really know how that is, but I promise you, Jesus is God's gift of ugly pajamas to the world. See, there was something about wearing matching pajamas, something about wearing the same outfit, having the same toy, that would remind us that we were in that space at my grandmother's house. We were like, this is us. This is the Alexander side of our family. This is an us. 
And Jesus is God's way of saying to the whole world, you are all part of an us now. You're all part of an us. And let's be honest, we know it's good to be part of an us. We spend time trying to be part of an us. It feels good to belong to something, to be part of something. We know how good it feels because then we get our our energy and our time sucked into social media trying to connect with uh, us. We see somebody who's similar and they post something similar or they're going through something similar and we're like, that makes sense because it's us. And we write these various things to connect us with certain people on social media just to further reinforce that us status. And throughout history, humanity has done a great job creating all sorts of identifiers to determine who is us, whether it's the color of our skin or our gender, our favorite football team and jerseys that you wear. I can be on a bike trail and pass someone with K-State, and I've got K-State, and suddenly we know each other. We're an us, right? There's that team affiliation. There's a political affiliation. There's even the affiliation at Christmas time, whether we like egg dog or not. I tried again last night. I thought I would like it more with age. I just don't. Anyone else? Do you like egg nog? No. Oh, good. See, the majority does not. That is not a popular thing. There are always things that help us fit in to make us an us, and it feels good to be an us. It feels good to be belonging and have that connection. You get to say, this is my tribe, this is my people, this is my family. It is great to be an us until you're not an us. Except when you're not. Except when you feel lonely and you feel afraid or hurt and abused or uninvited or cast out or excluded. Or generally you feel like, I just can't really fit in with other people. It's great to be an us, except when you feel deeply alone and unchosen, and then you feel like a them. On this night, we may imagine that this is how Mary and Joseph felt. They had to, they were summoned essentially so many years ago from going from Galilee and Nazareth to um, Bethlehem, place that they didn't know anyone, really. They had some relatives that they think there are there, but they, they know that that's where Joseph's family is from, and so they should go there. And when they get there, there's really no room for them at the inn. I've read that many times. Now, this may seem like a shock to you. It was for me. There are no Motel 6s in Bethlehem in Jesus' time. They were not on every corner with a light on so that they, Mary and Joseph knew exactly where to go. They weren't bed and breakfasts, just kind of ready and willing, uh, able to serve any kind of customer. In fact, the whole idea that they went to an inn, that there was no room for them at this inn, is actually a little untrue. The word here that has been translated to inn is katalume. And it's this fancy Greek word that you can use later tonight when you all get together for dessert and not drink your eggnog because that is not a popular thing that makes us an us. You can talk about catalume. This word catalume doesn't actually mean in. Catalume meant upper room or a spare room, a guest room. See, most people living in ancient times of of Jesus, they, they had one room. And in this one room, that was their living room. And in that one room, that's where they slept and they ate. It's where all their animals stayed. And that's where it was, they were kept the safest and secure. And so this part of the room was the main living space. And another part of the room might be where the animals kind of congregate. But that was one room. And if you were really lucky, really lucky, you might have a catalume. You might have a spare room and a guest room. Now, hospitality was just a pillar of the culture in the far Middle East. I mean, it really still is today. And so the culture dictated that if you did have a spare room, a catalume, this was a room that would be open to anybody who would come by. That's just what the culture dictated. And so that's what Mary and Joseph did. They would come by to this room or this this one house, and they would say, hey, I I would really like to see if there's room in your catalume, in your guest house, in your spare room. And they maybe were talking to a friend of a friend of a relative, a second cousin once removed of Joseph's, and they don't really know these people, but the people say, I'm sorry, our guest room is full. 
I'm really sorry. And you know that there's this moment of this pit in the stomach kind of sinking feeling for Mary, especially because she's probably getting the stirrings of labor pains already, knows something's, something's coming up and starts to have those pains. And she can imagine, you can imagine how anxious she feels and how worried Joseph feels for her. We can imagine that they're anticipating this baby's coming real soon and they wonder, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? And they're stressed because the spare room is full. But then the family continues. It's full, but you can stay with us in this room. Yeah, the animals are here, but you can stay with us in this room. See, when Scripture says that they laid Jesus in the manger, it was because there was no room in the catalume, no room in the guest house or the, private, the, the space that other people could use. So instead, this family said, come to our home. Come in, welcome into our private space. Come you who are strangers, you whom we just met a couple moments ago, but you say you're the second cousin of someone, so that sounds great, close enough to us, so come on in. Come to our living room, to our kitchen. Don't mind the sheep over here who is behind. This is our space, and you're welcome to come in to our bedroom, our living room, to the center of all that we do. Come to our Christmas Eve table. You're one of us now. And the comfort that that would have provided for Mary and Joseph. And it's in that moment, in this moment of radical hospitality in which their home was open, the hearts were open. It's when God pops through into this world, just breaks in and says, I will now live among you. I'm coming. I will forego all of my power, my grandeur, and my might because I love you so much that I will come down in the most vulnerable form you could possibly imagine a newborn baby, and I will live with you. And so here it is. It's the, it's the story that we see at the beginning with Genesis, or the story that began with the first voice speaking out over uh, the formless void, out into the, the darkness, piercing it and saying, let there be light. Here's this voice again saying something new and exciting is about to begin, and it's in the form of a baby crying. It's in the form of a whisper. It's a promise, and it's a promise of love. It is a promise of love itself, a love that overcomes every single boundary. It is a love that the prophets foretold. It's a love that the psalmist sang out. It's a love that people said for generations is incredibly faithful. It is a love that the choirs of angels sing about. It is a love that came to fruition in a relational and tangible and really human and messy way. And it is love. And that night, so many years ago, when God said, I will come down and I'm going to be with you, that's when the ultimate us, them thing breaks away. When we, we think of God as so almighty and so, um, so transcendent, so untouchable, we can't even look at God. And we think of us, us who are less than, that we're less than God, that divide is completely erased, it is completely um, moved away, washed away with amniotic fluid. It is breaking through because God is saying, you are mine now. You are part of a family. You're part of an us. So you no longer need to feel alone again. You never need to feel alone or broken or or disregarded because God is claiming you and continues to claim you each and every day. In fact, you don't have to feel alone and guarded because God has come down in human form and flesh to look like you and to be with you and to be with you, to be with you. You have never needed to feel so unworthy because we hear that song that the angels sing out so many years ago, that message that was told to the shepherds, for behold, I bring you news of great joy, which is for all people, all people, you and your neighbor, your weird relative who may be sitting next to you in the pew, (laughs) but guess what? They look over you and think you're kind of weird too. So we're all part of this. That coworker, you know the one I'm talking about. There's always one, maybe there's even two. That coworker too. Your most frustrating and annoying enemy. See, the love of God is good news for all people. It is good news for believers and non-believers and, and Christians 
and non-Christians. It's good news for the shepherds who are out there working that third shift late at night. It is good news for uh, Quirinius, the governor of Syria, it is, who's sitting up in his palace. It is good news for Mary, who is the teenager, frightened and wondering what in the world she's doing with this newborn baby, who hears that news and trusts to go forward with Joseph. And Joseph listens and trusts to move forward with Mary. And they go to Bethlehem. And even though they're frightened and worried, there's no place for them. It is good news for them too. And it is even good news for Augustus, the emperor, who forces the pregnant teenager to have to travel hundreds of, of miles when she's in that condition during a third trim trimester for tax purposes. See, the crazy thing is about this night, the good news of the night is it's not just about us who already believe. Instead, it's about breaking that open, that us definition and, and expanding um, what that meaning is and opening up those gates and saying, this is good news for everybody. If you were a king from Syria, if you were a shepherd in the field, if you were a young teenager, it's good for you, it's good for us, it's good for all of us. And it's good news that reaches and permeates every part of our being every day in every aspect of our lives. This is good news for George Bailey. It's also good news for old man Potter. It's good news for every who and whoville. And it's good news for the Grinch. It's good news for Kevin. And it's even good news for Harry and Marv, for those Home Alone fans. <laughs> it is good news for everyone, and everyone wins because it's now a bigger family that we get to be a part of. And when we know that, when we hear that, and we really digest what that means for us this Christmas, even if it's, if it's just for tonight, if we hear that message of how deeply loved you are, that you were loved so much that God chooses to let go of all God's power simply so that God can be with you and let you know you belong to God. Friends, if you know that and really hear it, it has the power to transform us and to change us. It has the power to help grow our hearts three sizes, like the Grinch. It transforms us in ways that we can't even imagine just yet. It, it's so that all of a sudden when we see a stranger on the street, we just reach out and we're like, you're my brother, you're my sister, we're, you're part of the us. We're friends now. We become like Scrooge when we watch the, the Christmas story, just breaking open those windows and, and shouting the news to the whole world so that everyone can hear it's something that you want to tell everyone and all other people. It's something you want to share because you remember what it's like to be alone. You remember what it's like to be uh, broken. You remember what it's like to feel so deeply flawed that if people really knew who you were, they wouldn't like you. You remember what that's like and you don't want other people to feel that way. You want them to feel love and so when you have found it, you want others to f find it as well. When you have been welcomed and been made part of that us, you want others to be part of that us as well. And when we appreciate how God came down and said, look, here's your ugly pajamas I'm giving you. Put them on. You're part of an us now. You're part of this family. You're part of this home. I want to be part of it too with you. And we get to go out and find others and just pass out more ugly pajamas to them too because they're all part of us and we're all in this together. Because the angels say, you too, you too are part of my family. If the love that was born so many years ago was as real as that we in this room know that it is, then the doors of our hearts get opened at Christmas. The doors of our homes get opened when there isn't any room in the guest house. The doors of our wallets open, the doors of our hands open so that we can reach out to people who need to feel loved and need a hug people who feel like a them, and we can let them know that they're an us. You're an us. You're loved. Welcome home, because you're found. Welcome home. Come on inside, even with the animals, because you're family. Emmanuel, God with us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are incredibly thankful for this opportunity each and every year to celebrate and be reminded of your birth so long ago in Jesus Christ, to recognize the, the ways that we can 
feel apart and alone and that you continually draw us back in as much as we need to be reminded that we're part of an us. So, God, may we take your word, may we hear your story, reflect on it, take it to heart, treasure it, so that we can let others know of your goodness and compassion that is here on earth, and that you make your presence known for us each and every day, because you are God with us. Emmanuel. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live a life of peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. And if you are normally in this church, you will recognize this is a little different, so I'll give you that heads up. So let us confess. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We go about our lives as if Christmas is an event to be celebrated but not lived. We hear the good news, but do not heed it. We turn away from the Holy Family, for there is no room in our hearts. We hear the cry of the expectant mother, desperate for care and a place to lie, but listen instead to the carols. We see the lowly children born in mangers among the filth of the world, but we look instead to the decorations. We hear the call of the angels to come and worship the newborn king, but we bow down to the idols of our culture. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us and free us for joyful obedience. Remove the barriers that we construct. Empower us to be a people doing the real, gritty, holy, graceful, loving work of Christmas every day. In the name of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for you while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness, brought forth life on earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from the captivity and you made a covenant to be our sovereign God. And you spoke to us through the prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang glory to you in the highest and peace to your people on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Mary and Joseph had to travel from Galilee to Bethlehem. And there they found that there was no room for them. And Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem. There was no room for him as well. He was despised and rejected. And in the poverty surrounded by animals, Jesus was born. So the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection would mean something to us. And it means that you gave birth to your church, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. As your word became flesh, born of a woman on that night so long ago, so on this night in which he gave himself for for us, we appreciate all that Jesus has done. Jesus took the bread in front of his disciples. He gave God thanks. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave God thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this as often as you gather in remembrance of of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of children who are all wearing these matching ugly pajamas, that we're all part of this us, I invite you now to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will our communion helpers please come forward? And as they are coming forward, I just want to highlight that uh, this table happens to be located in First United Methodist Church of Heath, but this is Christ's table. It is an open table, which means everyone is invited to come forward and participate and receive the elements. And as you come forward, I receive it by intention. We tear off a piece of the bread and dip it in the juice so that you can receive both elements at once. But we recognize that we still have viruses and COVID in our day and age. So we do have individual single serving. If you would like that, just come to my station and I'd be happy to give that to you. And likewise, if you need gluten-free, we can do that and accommodate that here. And that's so that we are completely inclusive of everybody's needs and make sure that everyone has the opportunity to come and participate in this holy sacrament of Holy Communion. And then when you receive the sacrament, you're welcome to go back to your pew in an attitude of prayer or kneel at the prayer rail for as long as you would like.
service where this is really like my family's favorite tradition and it's the, be, the opportunity to sing together as a congregation silent night with candles and so if you do not have a candle please um, see Margaret in the middle here or in the back and we'll make sure we get one for you but we'll light them just a little tip as we light them the person who has lit candle stays straight up and down the person who has unlit comes sideways so don't tilt your lit candle we'll get candle wax everywhere so just note make that note and we'll go ahead and and we'll sing our, our final song.
is a glorious light that has come into this world in the form of a baby born to us and for us so that we know the glory of our Lord God who loves us so very much. So treasure the story, tell the story, share it and rejoice in the Lord. Merry Christmas. Thank you.